When you were on the Rubin Report uh, not too long ago uh, in that discussion, you mentioned how uh, use of psilocybin straightens people out and uh, can produce these transcendent uh, experiences, which is jarring for a person who may have become I should have a never Christian, mentioned that on the Rubin which, Report, yeah, obviously. Which, for someone who became a Christian as a result of their only time doing magic mushrooms, that's a jarring piece of information. I was just wondering if you could expand on what you find um, intriguing about religious experience and what we can know about the transcendent from them, if, if anything. <laughs> That's a tough one, man. Um, the relationship between entheogenic use, let's say, which is sometimes what those chemicals are described, and religious experience is unspecified, but it looks like it's profound. There was a man named Gordon Wesson who wrote a book, if I remember correctly, called Soma. He was investigating the potential use of Amanita muscaria mushrooms among the people who wrote the Hindu holy scriptures thousands of years ago. And he felt that he identified the chemical that they were using, the, the sacred drink. Um, the use of ayahuasca and psilocybin mushrooms and so forth is well documented, particularly in North America. And the evidence, the empirical evidence that under certain conditions those chemicals can produce religious experiences is absolutely overwhelming. There's been good research done recently at Johns Hopkins looking at psilocybin, the first research that's been done on hallucinogens really in 30 years because people were so terrified of them in the 60s and for good reason, um, indicated that the people that they dosed with psilocybin, about 75% of them had a mystical experience, which they regarded as one of the five, three to five most important experiences of their life. And a year later, were characterized by permanent personality transformation, which was an increase in trait openness of one standard deviation, which is a lot, by the way. It moves you from 50th percentile to 85th percentile, for example. It's a, it's a huge move. And that looked permanent. Now, whether or not that's a good thing, that's a whole different issue. But they're very, very powerful. And they also did some recent research showing that psilocybin mushrooms were an unbelievably effective smoking cessation uh, intervention. So if I remember correctly, and I may have this wrong because it's been a while since I read it, they had an 80% success rate in, in stopping people from using uh, tobacco with one psilocybin experience. And so... Well, so those things are very, all of that's very interesting to me, and I don't exactly know what to make of it. I don't know what to make of it at all, not even a little bit. But, um, but the evidence for the relationship between met mystical experiences and hallucinogen use of certain types is incontrovertible, and I, don't, and I don't think anybody else knows what to derive from that. I mean, one conclusion is something like, Religious experiences are a common concomitant of going temporarily insane. And that, it's not a bad hypothesis because you see, for example, in the prodroma of illnesses like schizophrenia and sometimes manic depressive disorder too, on the manic end, you do see the emergence often of religious type delusions. It's not that common, but it's not uncommon. So it's definitely the case that if your brain function has been detrimentally affected one of the consequences can be experiences that are subjectively experienced as indistinguishable from the religious. You also see the same thing in cases of epilepsy, especially in the prodroma. So if you have an epileptic condition, sometimes you know that you're going to have a seizure. You can feel it mounting. And often, or at least occasionally, those experiences are associated with a, an elevation of religious sensation, deepening meaning, that increases in its depth and complexity until it's overwhelming and that's what subjectively brings on the seizure. Now, God only knows how to disentangle causality in a circumstance like that. Dostoevsky had seizures like that, by the way. So, so the, the, the pessimistic viewpoint is religious phenomenology is a consequence of brain disorder. The positive side more positive side is no, religious experience is a 
category of experience that's within the realm of human possibility. And there are different modes of eliciting it. And we know that there are many modes of eliciting it. Fasting can elicit it. Um, that's the, dancing under some circumstances. Music can elicit it. Music elicits it regularly. I mean, basically, as far as I'm concerned, rock concerts are indistinguishable from religious rituals. They're rituals, not like they don't come with a dogmatic overlay, let's say, but the ritualistic structure is there. And maybe it's there just listening to music. Um, what that means for the investigation of hallucinogens, I have no idea. And I would also certainly use the caution that Carl Jung developed when he was talking about hallucinogens. And he did that, I think, only a very brief number of times. And I think in relationship to Aldous Huxley's original work on mescaline experiences, he said, uh, beware of wisdom that you didn't earn. And that's very, very smart. So I would say there's something to be learned about, there's something, there's a lot to be learned about hallucinogens. There may be something to be learned from them. But having said that, um, if you play with fire, you end up burnt, generally speaking. So um, all due caution is in effect. <laughs>